4.30, we wake up, and then between 4.30 and 5.30, we need to prepare ourselves. That means bathing, uh, having him eating his breakfast, then I need to bath as well, and then we need to go out in the house at 5.30 in the morning. to take a taxi from uh, mainstream road. I need to cope with that. I need to cope even in a taxi when we when we get into the taxi and then we will start making noise and then you will see everyone turning looking you like okay what just happened and then some others will just ask me straight in my eye is this child crazy? Pumzile Vilakazi's son isn't crazy he was born with autism, a disease that affects brain development and behavior. Getting Mkolisi to a school for children with mental disability takes them four hours, three modes of transport, and 27 rand every morning. For a mother with a disabled child, traveling on public transport means dealing with constant stares on a daily basis. The overcrowded train can make Mkolisi anxious and aggressive. When he's in the train, you will see him rocking a lot, biting himself a lot because of he, he will be looking for, seeking for attention. He loves attention so much. So maybe he wants my phone, then he will bite and he will bounce his head. Uh, he will rock a lot. Eventually, when I give him my phone, and then he will be like, come. Some others, they will tell you that, uh, please, can you please uh, take your crazy child to another seat? And then the train will go and then we will arrive at town. Then at town, from town to Plumfontein, we go by, by foot. We will walk from, from the train station to the school. Because if we can afford a taxi fee again. Those hours, they are long hours for him because he needs to relax, he needs to take his medication and stuff. So it's like it, it ta it, taking us forever to get there. They say all children have a right to education, but for us it's not fair because if we need to travel so far to, to, be, to be at school, meanwhile a, a normal child can just walk past the road to get to school. But with us you need to travel with trains, tra travel with taxis. It, it, it's like a, a mission to get him at school. It's hard work, but Pumzile is simply grateful that he's in school at all. It's estimated that half a million disabled children across South Africa can't access their constitutional right to education. Only 3% of the National Department of Basic Education budget is spent on special needs schools. We went to in and out of schools because of some told me that he was not right for them. And then some, some schools where he went, he will come back with no shoe, no Jay-Z, in the way that you can see that he, he wasn't in a stable place, sitting still and learning something. I thought to myself, maybe I can just uh, stay with him at home, but it was highly impossible because he wanted school so much. He will tell you, mommy, school. I was so sad, it was so disappointing of me as a mother, playing a role, being a mother to Mkolisi, and then didn't know how to cater that for him. Yeah, it was highly sad. Of the 33 schools in the area that she lives, only eight can accommodate learners with mild impairments. But roughly two-thirds of the children in the area, including Mkolisi, are classified as severely impaired. Pumzile struggled for five years, trying eight different schools along the way, until she was finally able to get him into a well-resourced school that is equipped to teach autistic learners. But he's one of the lucky few. Especially for poor single mothers that have children with disabilities, um, it's almost impossible to try and find a school for your child to go to. It's very difficult, firstly, to figure out what the process is to even try and get your child into a school. And so the mother struggles, um, goes from pillar to post, gets her child on endless waiting lists um, and never hears back from schools and really, really struggles. 
Jean Elphick works for Africa Ticken, a developmental organization helping provide education, health and social services to children and their families in South African townships. There's a very close link, a demonstrated link between disability and poverty. And a lot of that stems from the fact that so few people with disabilities actually access an education. So if you look at uh, policies like saying all businesses should employ people with disabilities, there is the sort of demand, but the supply side is such a problem because so few people with disabilities get an education. In 2001, the Department of Education laid out the strategy for establishing an inclusive education system in South Africa, which would allow for abled and disabled children to learn side by side. Inclusive education means that certain public schools would be equipped to accommodate learners with mild to moderate disabilities, instead of having to build separate special schools to cater for them. The policy states that um, in a period of 20 years, um, the department would have converted 500 primary schools to become inclusive schools. But um, let me tell you that um, by February 2015, we're sitting at 793 schools that have already been converted and designated as, as inclusive schools. We were talking in 2012, we were talking about 124,000 learners with disabilities who are in mainstream schools and of course 111,000 who are in special schools. Despite the department having achieved some of its goals set out in the policy, disabled children are still routinely turned away from mainstream schools that can't accommodate them. Not all mothers will be as lucky as Pumzile to experience the joy of seeing their disabled child go to school. It was so lovely for me for him to be at school and for me as a mother to know that I have achieved something for him. I have achieved the biggest thing which is education. There are probably over half a million children in South Africa that are not going to school when they're the compulsory school going age. And children with dis disabilities form a disproportionate section of that, those children. Um, children that just do not get up like their brothers and sisters each morning, put on a school uniform and go to school. Many disabled youth in South Africa will never get to see the inside of a classroom. Even fewer will eventually matriculate. Makosi Ndambambi of rural Ingwavuma in KwaZulu-Natal is wheelchair-bound, but this is where her disability ends. There's absolutely nothing wrong with Makosi's intellectual abilities, yet at the age of 22, she is still stuck in grade 7, because there's no high school in the area that can accommodate her. It's make me angry. Because I don't know why are we repeating the same grade as many times. It's made me, I'm going to leave the school, never come back. And I ask myself, if I leave the school, never come back, what I must do? I must sit at home because I'm in grade 7 and I'm not going anywhere. I'm not going to be matriculated. I'm going to stay here at grade 7 until I'm getting old. The worst thing made me feel sad is that I'm getting old. Now I'm 22 years. It makes me sad. She's right to say that she's feeling like she's old now and not sure if she will get a metric certificate um, uh, because she's been held back so many times. You know, Makosi and, and, and the others that are in, in, in the intermediate phase are children that could do a grade once and move on um, if we had the space to do so. What upsets me the most is that we are still building schools that are not accessible to wheelchair users. Right now, as I speak, we are building schools in this country uh, that have stairs where, where classrooms on the first floor or the second floor won't be able to be accessed by children who have physical impairments. And in a society where, as I've said, we are in a, our educational system is in crisis, is that we are building for ourselves a legacy of exclusion, which is going to continue for decades and decades to come.
Dr. Brian Watermeyer is a clinical psychologist and a postdoctoral fellow in the Department of Psychology at Stellenbosch University. He feels that after two decades of democracy, the lives of South Africans living with disabilities have changed very little. Our special schooling system, well, I, I call it that, but what I mean, in fact, is our education, uh, be it in an inclusive setting or a special school setting for children who have impairments, is largely chaotic. Uh, it's inconsistent. There's uncertain resourcing. Well, the vast majority of South African disabled children are being let down by the education system. The Provincial Department of Education has admitted that there are no special needs high schools in the area, but that Makosi can enroll in any wheelchair-friendly school. But according to her primary school principal, this is impossible because none of them are equipped with wheelchair ramps. A 2006 survey of all 25,000 South African schools revealed that 97% had no accessible toilets and no ramps. Dr. Semelane from the National Department of Basic Education says that it will take some time before all schools are inclusive. Something like seven to ten years to actually do away with all the backlogs in terms of accessibility. So it's something that is in the plan of the department. Makosi, however, needs more than just ramps to go to school. She needs constant assistance to wheel around and to use the bathroom. She needs a school that can provide special care for her. When I'm here, it makes me feel sad because it's painful to see my friend walking around and I'm still sitting. Maybe they are going to play. I'm sitting here. And when they are helping me, I'm, I want to go to the toilet. Sometimes I wait for three days and don't go to the toilet. And it's make, sometimes it's make me, I want to cry, why it's me? It goes far beyond just uh, making sure that there's a, a, an accessible toilet and some ramps wherever there's stairs. It speaks to an in inclusive um, and accessible curriculum, accessible communication uh, between uh, educators and learners, and um, it's almost impossible to achieve without good training and ongoing support of teachers. And I think that in both those areas, the way that things have been done have been found lacking. Makosi School has a waiting list of over 2,000 students. Despite waiting lists being commonplace across the country, according to the National Department of Basic Education, they shouldn't exist at all. That is what we've been advising our provincial um, departments to say they need to, to study the admissions policy carefully because there is no way in the admissions policy where it talks about a school, be it a special school or whatever school, um, creating a waiting list and putting a, any child on a waiting list and keeping that and filing that at the school. What it says is if it's a child with special needs, and the school realizes that it is unable to provide the appropriate support that the child might need, then the, then, then the child's name must be submitted to the district office. Then it's up to the district director to find an alternative school so that the child is not kept at home um, and having his or her right violated. According to the principal of Makosi School, special needs education in South Africa is plagued by a shortage of teachers and a lack of specialized training. Another harsh reality is that there simply just aren't enough schools. Of the 25,000 schools across the country, only 444 of them are for children with disability. National statistics show that there's a shortage of 3,500 special schools. It's an extremely simple request, a basic need. It has, you know, very low in terms of needs. Um, and I don't think we, we, we should be having a problem about children asking to be educated. You know, the mainstream society is educated. I would like to go to university and do lot, I do more things that will make me happy one day and make my mom happy one day. South Africa has signed many international treaties pledging to provide universal education to all children. And for the most part, we have excellent legislation and policies regarding education in the country. The problem is lack of implementation of this at a provincial level. 
and it's learners like Makosi who bear the brunt of this. It's just policy to say that everybody has the right to all sorts of things. Everybody is included. Everybody is given an opportunity to become as whoever they are. Um, in terms of disability, I think the silence is deafening. I feel like I'm stuck because I'm already stuck. I'm in grade seven, I'm just going anywhere. There is nothing that I can do for now because I can't change that I, I'm just going to high school. I can't change that. It's happened. The worst thing is that I'm, should, my life would always be scary. I would always be sad. And my life is difficult. And if you are not being in school, always your life will be difficult. Disabled youth like Makosi and Dumbambi are being let down by a failing education system. If schools were fully inclusive and catered for a wide range of disabilities, she would have already matriculated by now. Instead, her future looks dim. It's making me, it's making me angry and angry and angry. And it's making me want to cry because I want to finish the school. I want to matriculate. I want to see me having the certificate matriculate. And if I think that I will, I've always said yes, I will do that. And if I know that I will not do that, it makes me feel like I'm going to leave the school. Because if I'm not matriculated, what can I do? I don't know that I have skill, skill that I can do. I don't think I have. Because my hands are not working. Need people to help me. So what can I do? We are creating a situation um, where a significant proportion of our population is growing up without education, without the opportunity to participate fully in the economy. And of course, that does represent a significant um, drag in terms of resources on our economy. But to me, there's a more basic question, which is to do with the fact that we are talking about disabled people in South Africa who live with the experience of being left behind. Pumzile knows firsthand the difficulties of getting a disabled child into school and the uphill battle has left her disillusioned with the South African education system. I, I felt like they, the system has forgotten him, the government has forgotten him. That means our children, they, they, they are not children to them, they appear as something else because of every time when they build a new school it would be a mainstream school not a special school that means they have forgotten about our children maybe they think we need to uh, homeschool our children we don't know but it's so devastating as a mother to see your child at home not going to school it's like it's bad it's bad Moving forward in life, your access to your socio-economic rights and to become independent and um, self-sufficient and to be able to one day support yourself is dramatically decreased when you do not have any, any education. Um, and so it's been shown that um, the ongoing inequalities um, experienced by people with disabilities is in, in many cases related to the lack of education. Uh, to which they have access to. For Mkolisi and Pumzile, years of perseverance have paid off. Being at a school that caters to his special needs has made all the difference. How are you today? I am fine. Fine, thank you. Since he has been to school, he has changed a lot. Because of now, I know how to, to, I know how to take him to shopping now. I know how to take him to movies and he will sit quietly watching at the screen. Even when we are watching TV here, you will see he will behave. His behavior has changed a lot. He's a nice person to be around and um, I think he's such a jolly guy that he's learned to listen to his mother a lot more. Um, he listens to her, her instructions 
um, he can communicate a lot easier and he's also learned other skills um, and made friends which I think is it's really wonderful. When it comes to computers and digital things, the gadgets, he's so brilliant in those things. Even with me, if I have a problem with my cell phone, I will ask him, can you please help me with this? And then he will be like helping. So you can see he's got potential. He can write, he can use a pen to write, but he can, he can type. Even with WhatsApp now, he will like, chat on WhatsApp, chat on Facebook, and it was like amazing, getting the spelling right, everything right in order because of his using the, the digital things. For years, Pumzile was unable to hold down a job because she needed to care for Mkolisi from home. Knowing how hard this can be, Pumzile and her mother have opened up a daycare center for disabled children in Orange Farm, southwest of Johannesburg. <laughs> So we saw how important it was for children to be enrolled somewhere, in a special school somewhere. So we have started up opening up the, that daycare centre. It, it, it was a blessing after all. Golisi was not a case in my life. He was a blessing because of, with him, I've got a job. With him, we had a daycare centre running. So it, it, it's like, it's amazing. Sadly, Makosi is yet to have gotten her happy ending. In 2014, only 1,300 disabled youth countrywide sat the matric examinations. If access to education for disabled youth in South Africa is not prioritized, Makosi and thousands like her will never matriculate. I have many times had the extremely painful experience of communicating with a disabled child and asked him or her what it is that you need, what do you hope for? And many times I've heard a child say, I just want to go to school. And that means I want to go where the other children go. I want to be part of what the other children do. It's extremely painful to hear that. I just want to go to school because it's not a lot to ask. I strongly believe that every child counts and therefore every child deserves to be given the kind of support that they need in order for them to, to, to succeed. We're talking about the future of an individual, so something needs to be done. It's not the fault of the child. You know, that, that, that is what worries me. I think this is an exceptional case. And my worry is, if there's nothing wrong cognitively, I mean really, something should be done. I cannot say what, but I think in our engagement with the province, we'll have to come up with a plan for the learner, but we cannot disadvantage a child. Dr. Similani from the National Department of Basic Education has given his commitment to look into Makosi's case. In the meantime, she can only dream of what matriculating would feel like. Wow. I don't know what I would do, but I would feel happy. It will be my happiest ever in life. Opening the paper, see my name, and say, Marcos Dabambi. Wow. That will make me happy. And the day I would be holding my certificate, what would be? Maybe it will be the end of my world, I don't know, but I'll be happy.